Feels like about half that at the moment, Open Jess, is the deal, and that's pretty much what it was Connection yesterday. No it open. will get warmer later in the day, but I didn't say it'll be warm, just to make the distinction. So the cars are rolling out now for Armour All qualifying, and we're getting ready for what's going to be an extremely busy day. We've got two qualifying sessions virtually back to back here now, and then we've got two sprint races again today. They'll be 100 kilometres in distance. Exactly the same as per yesterday. Great shot of the Dunlop Super Soft tyre that they're running this weekend. As they came into qualifying yesterday, they had 20 of those tyres available, or five sets. They've got to use them judiciously through this weekend. Beautiful shot on Google Earth of where we are this weekend. Event for Repco Supercars Championship, the Ned Whiskey Tasmania Super Sprint. We're around about 30 odd kilometres to the south of Launceston. Simmons Plains Raceway, 50th time. There's been a championship round at this beautiful old location. It's a popular racetrack because it always turns on a ton of action for us around here. It's short, sharp and simple, 2.4 kilometres, mile and a half in the old language, seven corners around here, characterised by two very quick straights and a huge premium on braking performance going into that hairpin at turn four and up into the left-hander at turn six, which ultimately turns into one gigantic long left-hander at six and seven. The story so far, well, it's been a very busy, busy weekend and we saw a pile of action at Turn 4. We always see it year on year. They were just discussing it a few moments ago on the host desk. Unfortunately for Brock Feeney and for Chaz Mostert, that resulted in some damage for Mostert. But what about Will Brown? What an extraordinary performance yesterday. Got the armour all pole position and then he capitalised with a beautiful win. He got home by six tenths of a second from Andre Heimgarten, who's had a gigantic switch around in form since the last event in Western Australia. So it was Will over Heimgartner, over Shane Van Gisbergen, who strategically put together a nice race yesterday to get himself on the podium. And he did that with about four or 500 metres remaining in that race after 42 laps. Now, it's the reset button that we hit and we do it all again. It is clear, it is cold, but it's not as brutally cold as it was yesterday. It's a little bit warmer than the same time as it was yesterday. And so we've also got a wind change as well. Yesterday was far more northwesterly. It's a bit more of a southwesterly out there at the moment. So that'll be one of the things that they need to adjust to as they acclimatise with the racetrack. Time now to say a very good morning to Rihanna. Good morning, Crumpo. Well, it was a sense of relief for Scott Pye and Team 18 yesterday. Qualified in 10th, crossed the line for the race in position 5. They were pretty honest about their performance last time out in Perth. It wasn't good enough. So they actually undertook a secret test uh, since then. So they're really welcoming that return to form and hoping they can continue that here today. One guy who flew brilliantly under the radar yesterday was Tim Slade down at New Lawn Racing. He started 12th, didn't have a great qualifying car yesterday, but drove up through the field, nailed the strategy, finished sixth. Speaking to Tim this morning, he said he probably didn't really have that sort of speed, got a little bit lucky with some of the cars falling off the racetrack in front of him, similar to Shane Van Gisbergen. We've got these cars about to come into the pit lane, by the way. But for them today, it's finding some more qualifying speed. They sit seventh in the team championship New Lawn Racing. We might see them heading further down pit lane toward, towards next year. Matt Stone Racing right here, Jack LeBrock and Cameron Hill, their best ever result, or certainly as good as their best ever result, a seventh and an eighth yesterday. Remember, I did that little story about Matt Stone Racing a couple of weeks ago, and I really like this little team because this new era of car is absolutely working for them. Jack was on the front yesterday. This team has about half the staff as the bigger teams up the other end of pit lane. I'd say probably half the budget as well, so really well done, doing a top job, a bit of Stone Brothers DNA in here. One of the biggest movers and shakers in yesterday's race was Thomas Randall. He came from 18th on the grid, got all the way to 10th. He was at pains to show me after the race, not a mark on the car. He had a fast car in practice. He was fourth in practice too. If he can qualify towards the front, maybe he can give Cam Waters a hand up the front for that forward battle. Our expert team in the pit lane, in the pit paddock, Rihanna, Chad, Craig, Garth and Mark. Now, GT just said there's no marks on the car, but there's a mark in the commentary box. Good morning, Mark Scott. <laughs> Morning, Cropo. I'm looking forward to this. You just made the point about the difference in the wind direction. It's quite substantial versus yesterday. And Cam Waters has put it to great effect straight away with a 51-2 from Brody Kostecki with a 51-3. Very nice opening laps from both of those young men. Great performance yesterday by Coca-Cola Racing, by Erebus and Will Brown to not only grab an armour all pole position, but to convert it beautifully as a race victory. But often what we see with the three sprint races down here, and we saw this in evidence in Western Australia, is that each is completely unlike the other. 
So we don't necessarily, last year we did get three from three for Shane Van Gisbergen. and that doesn't always translate, does it, Mark? So yeah, if you think about pleasure. what happened with Brock Feeney. Uh, Martin Short just talking to Brock Feeney. Think about what happened to Brock, for example, in Western Australia. In a preceding race, he qualified 21st, and the next one he bolted and won the race. So that's been one of the characteristics so far this year, is trying to bolt together consistency. And about the only people that have really had anything that looks like that has actually been Erebus. Yeah. They've been the ones that across both sides of the garage have stitched together more podiums, or they podi than any other. So it's 13 for Erebus after yesterday. And from a team perspective, the next closest is Triple Eight, and they've achieved nine of them. So that's all credit to everybody down there at Erebus, for the men and women down there. No doubt. So Cam Waters from Brody Kostecki, 51-2-1, plays 51-2-6, so 0.05 between them. Nick Perkat just moved up. Anton Di Pasquale now comes up 15 positions into fifth. So nice job. 51-3-9. Jack LeBrock now comes up 13 spots and goes to third. And there's nothing as per normal at this venue across those first five or six cars. I think I could do a little bit better job driving. I'm a little bit nervous in the third six, but I think it's okay. But if you could almost apply that comment on the radio feedback there to 25 of the operators. It's a little bit nervous into turn six. Every time we've taken that shot of the cars arriving in there, they're skating in there on the rear brake. It's one of those corners, and particularly where there's a wind change day on day here, you find that your braking references can change just by a few metres, and it can make things pretty lively. This is the braking approach into turn six. Mighty impressed with the performance. Mark Larkham covered it off just a moment ago. Matt Stone Racing, truck assist cars. They're running and building their own program this year, and Jack's been really impressive again here this weekend, as he was last year, and then really dipped my hat to Cam Hill yesterday, his best ever result in a Supercars Championship race, a former Carrera Cup champion, and he put together a lovely campaign yesterday. And it's always an important thing for one of the younger drivers. They've invariably grown up wishing, hoping, crossing their fingers and everything else that they could become part of this circus. And then the first thing is you want to get in the circus, then you want to see where you sit within it, and then you want to be competitive within it, and then when you realise that some of the people that you admired are behind you, that's a rewarding moment. And that'll actually be one of the things that he carried last night to bed when he went back to the hotel to go, that was pretty cool. For sure. I mean, he had a great battle with Van Gisbergen, didn't he, yesterday? So that was excellent. Now, Thomas Randall has just done the fastest first sector. He was very fast yesterday. In fact, he was fourth in... Uh, practice two and looked like in qualifying that he was going to be right up there in contention. Didn't get a lap together as well as he would have liked, but he's on a very good lap now. Oh, Van Gisbergen now off. So that's, he was on a very good lap also. Van Gisbergen was on his personal best at both of those sectors that we've seen. And what does Randall do? He does a 51-1, goes to the top, up 22 spots. Well done, Thomas Randall. Still got six and a half minutes remaining in this session, so Thomas has pulled a trigger early. We'll see how that stands. Remembering that this is just essentially a straightforward, old-fashioned qualifying session. You do the session, you get the end of it, and there's a sword order from 1 to 25. There's no elimination I have process. No I have no charge, but I can keep up it. Yeah. So they're all talking about getting a toe now. Interestingly, Randall did not have a toe, and David Reynolds did not either. So here we go. So he's got a toe now. now. Van Gisbergen for sure got a toe there from Golding and locks the left front and off the road. He'd be very frustrated with himself because, as I said, those two numbers at that point were definitely going to improve him. And Randall goes again, Neil. He, he does a 51-08 by himself without a toe on his second lap has improved the margin again. Nice job, and he was particularly impressive in the first and third sectors, so 51.08. Craig? Hey guys, just watching the exit of the attitude of the last corner here, obviously teams have been able to have 24 hours to sharpen these cars up from yesterday's race, but you mentioned the wind direction. It's now a tailwind down into Turn 6, which may have caught Shane out. But watching the attitude, as I said, coming on the exit of Turn 6, cars look much nicer. They're riding and being more compliant over the bump. So whether it's the wind direction, as I said, whether the teams have been uh, had a bit of time to actually sharpen these cars up, but they look much nicer on the exit of Turn 7.
Hey, Scafie, good thing that Tom Randall went for that second lap and improved then because that first one could have been under yellow flags as well because he was behind Shane Van Gisbergen. So improving on that second lap might just give them that extra buffer of safety. Yeah, good point, Chad. I was thinking that before, whether the yellow flag was out. But what I was mostly interested in and what was really impressive is there's absolutely no toe for Randall. So if he's able to go again and park himself in behind somebody there's probably another one and a half tenths of a second to be found with Thomas Randall. Slightly slower today than yesterday at this point. But remember, we've got four and a half minutes remaining. Two tenths of a second. So the 50.87 yesterday for Will Brown was the time that got him the pole position. We're currently looking at a 51.08 for Tom Randall. So 25 kilometres an hour in rounded terms from the north-northwest yesterday. Today, 25 kilometres an hour from the south-southeast. So very different yeah, conditions. Cars, Takes a little bit to get your brain around when you first go out on this racetrack because it does have a dramatic impact on those two sensitive areas up into the head oh, yeah. and into the braking area of turn closer. six. How's this for congestion? So we're going to see 25 guys all in max attack mode here with just under four minutes remaining. This is qualifying. Race 11 of the championship. We've got two sprint races today, then there'll be a short break, and then we'll do qualifying for our final race as well. Why's he done this again? He's going to get traffic again, isn't he? This is what happened yesterday. We always hold our breath when someone's on a different sequence, particularly on one of the shorter tracks. This is not a committed lap at this point, so Jack Smith just waiting there to get an all clear on the radio for him to go out. So Mark's talking about Mark Winterbottom here. You can see in the background of the shot, but have a look at them on the back straight, turn five. They're all at walking pace. There's no tyre temperature in that. And uh, this is always one of the things that gets debated around here for everybody trying to find some space. So there invariably will be tales of woe. Now we've got exactly three minutes remaining. Three minutes. And uh, it's this the Car Park Grand Prix. This is a They're all doing 40 kilometres an hour, GT. Garth, go for it. <laughs> I'm getting quick before this tees off. Uh, Thomas Randall took two new rear tyres, kept the hot front tyres on the car. I think that's a smart play. And just one thing with the wind changing direction from yesterday, guys, the toe's not as powerful. When you have a tailwind up the Brack Strait, the toe's not as critical. So maybe having that clear air might be the hot ticket. The hot ticket at the moment <laughs> actually just trying to find some real estate because they're all parked on top of each other at the moment. Supercar bunk beds, they're all on top. So right now it's 5108. Thomas Randall is the man that has the number from his teammate Cam Waters, Brody Kostecki. And it'll be the commencement of the next lap before we start to see some sense here. This is frustrating you, Mark. Oh, my God. Completely ridiculous. They're at walking pace on the main straight. Seriously. Oh. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah. Oh, my God. Here we go. New Lon Racing. I just spoke to Peter Zubris a few moments ago. James Golding. Peter was blasting up and down the drag strip at Western Sydney Dragway in Sydney a couple of weeks ago. I don't know how he does that. Right now, his focus is on James Golding. James has been there or thereabouts this year. We've talked about the prospect of a podium coming his way. Turn two, three. They're teetering on the grip edge. Bring right here that awesome BP Ultimate Speed Cam shot on the arrival and departure. Now, depending on the wind on the run up to the hairpin, it's 245 kilometres an hour. And there's a little bit of a challenge there trying to pull these cars up and get them to creep around the outside of that hairpin. It came off there very strongly, though. Will Davison's gone faster in sector one than anybody else. We're coming up to the one minute mark to conclude qualifying for race number 11. This is going to be highly energised at the back end. And even just looking at our tracking, essentially the entire field is all at one end of the pork chop. They're all right down the other end at turn four and out the other side. So it is unbelievably cluttered out there at the moment. Golding's just come up 13 spots. Out by himself, has done a great job. So he's gone to second. Will Davison now goes to the top. Will Brown now goes to the top of the 50.8. And Brody Kostecki's just grabbed him too. And that reproduces the best numbers that we saw from yesterday. Right now, Coca-Cola have got a one and two stitched up with 30 seconds remaining. Does anybody have anything else in store here to respond? What about Brock Feeney? He looks quick and so does Cam Waters. Cam's peeled a tenth out of the first sector. 
at the moment. Kostecki, now Feeney, who's gone to P2, then Brown, then LeBrock. But watch out for Waters. He's getting the benefit from the toe. Now, is this going to fumble him when he gets to the breaking area? He makes a bit of ground here into turn six. Chicken and is that going to cost him? It does, it does. It does. Unbelievable. He did not need that right at that moment. He's had to make a passing move on a quality lap. Is he going to move up? Not enough. So he stays in eighth. They have tripped themselves up. Cam Waters was on to put that car on pole position. Fastest first sector. And they run into each other at turn six, which started with the ball being so congested. That's how it started. 50.8335. 50.87 yesterday for Will Brown. Brody Kostecki gets an armour or pole. Plenty of chat on the radio. And it will be mostly about missed opportunities and congestion. There's the man that got the job done. So what a brilliant drive when it mattered most, and that will move him along. And there was a little bit of a bobble there from Anton right in the middle of all that as well, which just made it even more awkward. But you do not want to be touching or passing cars. Here's another view of the replay. We were on board live at this point. He got the benefit of the toe. He touched the rev limiter, feeding it gears, and then the little bobble there with the rear brakes locked for Anton was enough to make the nose-to-tail contact, and then he slides down the inside. But that last sector, and you watch... They'll be grimacing in the garage there, seeing those pictures. Sam Potter, Brad Wisherson, they know what that means. Sam's competing closest to camera. So yeah. it's an angry Cam Waters, frustrated to have to deal with that in qualifying. But Brody gets the gold. He came in here this weekend with two armor or poles. Make that number three now. And these guys are strong, aren't they? They are proving it every racetrack that they visit at the moment. Great job, Brock Feeney as well. Remember, he had a front row start here last year as well. He's gone so, so close, Mark. The number officially, 0.0029 slower than Kostecki. That's, uh, it's almost a shame that you've got to separate them by the thousandth and the ten thousandth when they've done such a great job in the garage and in the cockpit. Will Brown in third, then LeBrock again confirming the form. And Cam Hill, so much going on at the back end. We didn't see those guys, so for LeBrock and Cam, well done. Jack LeBrock and Cam Hill. Then Golding, Davison, Randall, Waters, uh, beg your pardon, Reynolds and then Waters, followed then by Van Gisberg and outside the top 10. Armour all pole position. There'll be a bit to talk about off the back of this one, but they can't talk for too long because they've got to go and do it all again. Brody Kostecki lost a little bit of that championship advantage yesterday. Started out with a 100-point cushion, went down to 74 points. But what he's got on his side at the moment is great pace. Showing it in qualifying, showing it in the racing. And uh, another perfect job there today. And he'll be a cranky man, as Garth suggested earlier today in the coverage. Trying to make amends for what happened yesterday. And he's down there right now, GT. Brody Kostecki takes his fourth career armour or pole award. Don't tell me the team unhappy about that. The sticker's already on the car. Brody Kostecki, great comeback from yesterday's race. That was crazy close, that qualifying session. Yeah, I didn't realise how tight it was, so I just saw the timing screen here. So, yeah, great way to bounce back from yesterday, and the um, car felt pretty strong. So, yeah, it's pretty important to get a toe around here as well. I think it's, you know, worth up to two and a half tenths. So, uh, yeah, we'll see how we go this next one, and, yeah, just uh, see if we can get back to back. Tell me about the lead-up to that last run. It looked like a car park out there. Everyone was trying to get a toe off each other. How'd you go with all that? Yeah, I don't do much grocery shopping, so, um, yeah, I haven't had too much practice with that. But, um, yeah, it's a bit crazy out there, but just, yeah, got into a good spot, um, yeah, there, and uh, just got a toe off Andre, and, yeah, just had a good lap. Good luck in the next one. Thank you. Great job for everybody down there at Erebus. I want to go back and relive this one because it's determined by the tiniest of margins. So let's jump on board and remember all of the traffic was at play here as well. Let's enjoy Brody's lap.
Wow. Cool lap, but I, I wouldn't want her to try and do that week in, week out when you've got another car right under the front bumper. Betty Klemenko enjoying their great success at the moment, but well done to Brody Kostecki. Mark Larkham. Yeah, I wanted to just grab Timmy Edwards, who walked right into frame, right on cue. Thank you, Tim. Mate, I've got to say, standing here and listening to silence for 45 seconds of the lap and then hear the whole field go past in a gaggle. I was with Scaifey, mate, shaking my head, thinking, what are these guys doing? Not to put too fine a point on it, but your man was seriously maybe on for a pole, or certainly front row, fastest first sector in the traffic. I mean, wow. Well, n nobody wants to go first. Everybody wants to tow, so you're kind of, you're, you're all playing cat and mouse. And then obviously they all did fairly slow out laps as well, and you all just trip over each other. So yeah, you can you can be brave, go for a clear track early, and I think I think uh, Scotty Pye went early, and he's pee nowhere because he was trundling around on his own with nobody to tow him. So it's um yeah, it's a tricky one. It is a tricky one. Well, the, the wind has turned around, so I don't know if a tow was such important. I don't know if the engineers wanted that well enough, but I think clear air was worth a lot just then, Tim. Well, easy after the fact, isn't it, eh? It is, but maybe go and ask Scotty Pye what he thinks. He went early and he's peed nowhere, so, you know, you just don't know what you don't know. I mean, at the end of the day, um, wind or no wind, I mean, a tow is worth a lot round here. So, um, so yeah, yeah, everybody's looking for it, and if you look at Cam's top speed, it was mighty. But that was because, look, look, at, look at the hole that was being punched in the air in front of him. Fair point. Well said. No worries. Cam Hill, Truck Assist Racing, yesterday on the grid you were seventh, today you've gone two better, P5, an awesome result, congratulations. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think we've got great cars this weekend here at Truck Assist Racing and just going about the process, just focusing on getting that tyre preparation right and going out there and doing a lap. How are you finding these sessions? A lot happens really, really fast. <laughs> yeah, it does and that was pretty crazy, everyone was playing games, so I think it's going to be more of the same this time. We sure the best, good luck. Cheers. With Ben Croke, team principal for Shell V Power. Anton Di Pasquale looked like he was on a good lap at the end there. Yeah, he was. He was actually on. Um, he was green on the on the timing screen, so he was on his best lap for the session there. So, yeah, I'm not sure what uh, proceeded to take place into six. I guess Kem must have been a touch better and thought he'd just move him out of the road. I don't know. So, do you think that's probably what's hurt you, buried Anton in the field for this one? Uh, I think he would have been a little bit better. Would it have been top ten? Maybe not. But uh, we probably could have been up a few more spots. Uh, improvements for the cars for today? You feel like the cars are better after yesterday? Yeah, I think so, yeah. Um, 17 is probably the, the first of the Mustangs there, so it's not a bad effort. And, um, you know, I think Anton maybe, maybe should have been forward a couple more spots as well. So. Thanks, Ben. Thanks. Anton Di Pasquale contemplating the universe at the moment as he prepares for Armour qualifying race number 12. Scaffy, I just want to mention something very important as well. It's International Volunteers Week. I know you love to volunteer your time for nothing constantly, but there are a lot of people here who do an enormous job for us in motorsport and generally in sport, professional and amateur sports around the world. So thank you to everybody, our Motorsport Australia officials who give their time. We cannot function these race events without all of that huge effort hundreds, if not thousands of people, particularly we get to places like Bathurst, and it's an extremely valued contribution, so thank you very much. Well said, Neil. I don't know why you had to give me a whack on the way into that nice gesture that you just rolled out. Just Thomas Randall there waving. Occasionally need to get one on the board. He did a really good job in that session. Out by himself was the fastest car prior to that craziness at the end. And great to have people back at the races. This has been such an historic venue for the Australian Touring Car Championship and for supercars. It's our 50th visit to Simmons Plains and fantastic to have such a great crowd in. We know it's a little colder. Everyone's got their jackets on and the southerly today has made it a little colder than it was yesterday also. So we've got now another quick fire 10 minute qualifying session. And I reckon there's, if you were doing a form guide, there's probably 10 or 12 in the field who could be at the pointy end of this. So very competitive, seconds. this circuit. Copy, 30 seconds. Only two tenths of a second across the top 10. And looking forward to the rip, tear and bust of another one of these 10-minute sessions.
one of the more deflating things in motorsport is to look at the dashboard at the end of what will often be a huge personal exertion lap, get to the end of it, and you look at that number, if it were typically one to two tenths of a second away from what might be the peak, you'd think that's not bad, might have me somewhere there or thereabouts, but so tight in that midfield at the moment, the two tenths exit. of a second is tumbling me is way out of the show. And uh, that's hard to deal with, and it's actually hard to find. Yeah, you know, and it's the sum of many parts. It's not one thing. It's not as simple as just doing one thing in the cockpit or one thing to the car. You invariably find that it's a combination of a hundred little things that actually creates that. If you think about what 2,400 odd metres of racetrack looks like, feels like, and then compare two tenths of a second and turn time into distance, you're looking for millimetres in every little section of the track. So that's a combination of all kinds of things. Power delivery, power, ride and handling, tyre temperature, weight distribution, your human interaction with the device. There are a lot of decisions being made out there that when we're sitting in the commentary box and looking at these beautiful pictures, we kind of take them for granted. But at home, park yourself in, in rounded terms, a tonne and a half of car with you and the fuel and the device. Sit yourself few millimetres off the road and be arriving at the end of that back straight at the best part of 260 kilometres an hour and then make the decision, a perfect decision by the way, that is not 10 millimetre too early when you put your foot on the brake or 10 millimetres too late when you put your foot on the brake because either way that's going to be the difference between being a hero and zero. So it's a great art form. Certainly is. Some of these drivers are the best in the touring car world at putting a lap together. Qualifying so important given it's so difficult to pass here. Thomas Randall's got himself into a pretty good spot there in behind his teammate James Courtney. So he's going to get a little toe this time. Might be a little bit too far back. But as Garth said earlier, the Toe with a tailwind is not quite as important. The number there for Randall is fastest in the middle sector there so far, and he does a 5137. So that's about three tenths away from the number that he did last time. So that time that we saw in the previous session, 50.83 by the time his fraction's only four one hundreds, fastest time of the weekend, despite the different conditions. So that gives us a benchmark. There won't be much difference in temperature or wind looking at what's going on out there at the moment, session on session. But what you may get is a little benefit from having gone and done it once now. Yep, yep. So perhaps there'd be a tiny fractional change to a tyre pressure, maybe a little ride height or some other tiny tweak, a little change to the pedders, shock absorber. That might get the job done. So right now, because these are longer sessions in relative terms, they're 15 minutes, go out there, get a feel for it, make sure it's trimmed and that you're in the zone, your brake biases are right, you've got those anti-roll bars where you want them to be, which are done manually beneath the car now, and then go out and have a crack. Now we might see, if things don't change too much, weather-wise, off the end of the road there, turn four for Cam Hill. We might see another little fractional improvement session on session when they're so close together. Yeah. Because you effectively get the benefit of practice effect. Matt Payne's has done a nice job. He's come up to third to be the fastest Mustang with a 51.07. So Heimgarten a 51.06. Brock Feeney, 51.07. Matt Payne, 51.07. Cam Waters, 51.08. There's 195 ten thousandths of a second across the top four cars. Just over 11 minutes remain in the session. So early exploratories at the moment. Hyde Gartner over Feeney, who did a mighty job in that previous qualifying from Payne. That's a good opening account. Then Waters, who was angry. Golding, Winterbottom, Slade, Van Gisbergen, and Hazelwood and Brown. Just outside is Will Davison, then Pye, who ended up 25th in that previous one. Randall, Dick Squarman, Reynolds, Courtney, Smith, Fullwood, Hill, Fraser, Jones, Brody Kostecki, not really an indicative time, and we've not seen a time recorded at all at the moment by Chaz Mostert, so he's waiting, still sitting in the pit lane, to do a number. I think he's gone and done an out and straight back in for car number 25 for the Mobile One Optus Racing entry. So, Mark, if you were in search of one of those 
half a tenth or a tenth of a second and you've just gone out in qualifying 11, you're attacking 12 now and you're back in the driver's seat, how do you go about trying to find some more? Do you go in search of it or do you just try and repeat what you did? Are you in search of a little bit more or does that put you into the never-never? I think if you're always in search for what the little mistake was, you, you know, you, sort of, you, you will have finished the previous qualifying session and then said, I reckon I can be slightly better here and here. And if, even if it's just a little bit of gear change efficiency off the hairpin or a little bit deeper at the end of the back straight or a little bit of a change of curb usage at turn two, whatever that is, whatever that little margin is, there's always half a tenth or a tenth in your own performance, isn't there? So that's what you're looking for. Drivers really jump out and go, that was perfection. Yeah. Let's have a look at the replay here of Cam Waters and the Monster Mustang. A little inside front locking on that one. Maybe carted him off the apex a little bit. It actually didn't like those bumps right at the end of the back straight, did it? Here's another angle. And it may have even been set off by the rear of the car. If you look at the way it porpoised its way up in there and was moving around a little bit. So sometimes you end up with too much livelihood, uh, lively action at the back of the car and they start to dance on the rear brake. It unsettles the front as well. This is what happened to Cam Hill. So Ooh. he decided to plough on up there. We saw that from the shot above that earlier. And, uh, ah, that's a little bit more to the, is that, that's it, that is Cam, that's the other angle from, so actually Andre had a bit to play with that because he was on the racing line. Exactly. So he's had to go around him to do it. So the minute you move the car around, it unloads the front tyres. Now I understand a bit more about what's going on there. Yeah. And the, the, when we were on board there with Heimgart, you could see that right front that was locked. Cam, that's actually the black mark We've just driven straight over there, James Courtney. So that was that black mark that was on the road. And he, in the end, gave the brake away and just run it down the escape road as far as he could without getting into the debris. So Cam Hill, awkward spot there. And if you have to just slightly shift the car in the braking area, it will just unweight the wheel just enough to lock a tire. And when you've done that, it's over and out. So James Courtney was very fast in practice yesterday. And I'm interested to see, well, that's a good job. So he's come up 12 spots, up to fifth. So it's interesting to see, and he's out by himself, so there's no tow for him at this point. Seven and a half minutes remaining. Heimgartner, Feeney, Payne, Waters. 51.06, 51.07, 51.07, Thomas Randall now on a good lap. Larko? Yes, Gavey, I mean, you talk, you guys talking about the need for strategy in qualifying. That's what's going on. And it's funny, I reflect on all the leading cars here, six of them here, and I haven't seen one car change, one bit of work on either of the cars during this session. And interesting, this Cam Waters car, I mean, they're looking for that tow, because this car, when you see it, is a little more like this. It's got a gap under the wheel arch here. You watch it when it goes out. They quickly come for a run up here when... Will Davo's car and Anton Di Pasquale's car sit on the ground. You said it yesterday. They sit down really flat because they've got their noses up in the air, which is good for going down the straight and their bums right down. You call it speed boating, Scaphy? I call it a dog with worms. <laughs> yeah, thanks for that, Marco. Uh, just while you're finishing that, we witnessed the lap completed by Randall. Now, he's just done a 50.84, and you compare that to the 50.83 that Brody achieved in the previous session for the pole position. That is a very, very strong number. And, Mark, I speculated before as to whether there could be a gain in this session. Thomas did a 51.05 in the previous, so he's found almost two-tenths of a second between qualifying 11 and 12. And uh, that's one of the reasons. <laughs> yeah, so the, the wind I'm at, looking outside the com box window here at the moment, that was 25 kilometres an hour when we started the session, and uh, some of those are going nowhere at the moment. So there's been a pretty dramatic change, Craig. It is, and it's, you talk about, uh, like I was talking about strategy, you know, I just watched Jack LeBrock. He didn't go out in that first phase of cars in that uh, beginning of this session. He sat in pit lane with a brand new set of soft Dunlops on the car, soaking as much heat as he could off the brakes. He's just gone out, come straight back in. So he's rotated a, a brand new set, and he's sitting here, and we talked about, obviously, the slipstreaming effect. So he's now going to go out and wait for the rest of this train to go out. So you talk about different strategies. Now, there's a lot of pressure on Jack because he hasn't posted a time. So he's got to get this one lap right. 
Well, it's very quiet out on the racetrack. There's not a car out there. You should check, check a look at the flags and look at the wind direction that has changed 180 degrees from when we started this session. So Neil made the point that the wind or well, the flags weren't flying. Well, they're flying now, but now it's a tailwind down to the hairpin and a headwind up the back straight. So back to where we were yesterday. You need to adjust your braking marker for the hairpin. You need to adjust your braking marker for turn six. And you need to find a dance partner for a toe down the back straight. It's going to be fascinating to watch how this one plays out. And you need to bring your own meteorologist to keep up with what's going on because it's been moving around a lot this morning, one direction to another. And it's actually an important tool to park in the back of your thoughts from a driving perspective here because it has so much influence in the braking up into turn four and turn six. But that time, again, re-emphasising the performance there of Thomas Randall, four and three quarter minutes remaining in this session. That's a big number and uh, a strong improvement for him between sessions, between qualifying 11 and 12 mark. Um, I mean, this is just fascinating to watch, Crompo. I mean, we've been doing this forever and I can't remember a period so long where the pit lane sat idle without a single sound. Not one car. And now look at this. Scafe, strap, Crompo, strap him down, mate. He's going to go off here because I tell you, they're all backing him out. They're all going to do it again. His heart rate monitor was actually starting to... The numbers were just rotating earlier in that other session when 25 cars were all on top of each other, all hoping that the other would provide a tow. So let's see what happens in this one. Four minutes remaining, each looking at the other, trying to find a gap. And they go after it because it is so valuable here. If you get it right, it's worth the chase, but we've seen a couple of examples here where it hasn't. So Cam Waters and Anton Di Pasquale, Cam getting the benefit of the hole drill in the air on the run up to turn six, and then all of a sudden a little mistake by Anton. Now you're passing a car in qualifying, and we're busy cracking on here about trying to find a hundredth. When you're making contact, then, then seconds or tenths of seconds are going to disappear. So back to the conversation about wind. Back to the northwest again out of our com box window here at the moment. And even as I'm saying it, it's swinging. Yep. So it's all over the shop. So in the end, you're just going to have to go out there and do your thing and use innate skill and the feel and the understanding that each of these drivers have got with their race cars. The reason why they're out there is they've already achieved a lot in motorsport. So they already have a great innate sense of what it's like to understand what the car's telegraphing back to the palms of their hands and the seat of their pants. Thomas has done. He could be pretty happy with that number because that's pretty much peak of class. You know, 50.83 was the best that we've seen. Now, why would those two Walkinshaw Andretti cars be as close as that to commence the lap? Can you explain that to me? I have no answer for that. Because it, it, neither of them get the benefit of this. You need to be, at the moment, you've got to warm the tyre. So right now, obviously, they're, they're going to do a sort of a 70% style lap to warm the tyre. And it does look under that scenario that Monster will be the benefactor of the tow from Percat if they remain in line like that. But here we go. So although they've spread themselves out more now, and they've actually had essentially one more lap than last time. So now we're going to see the business end, and this is sensible now. That's a good margin. And Mostert will be doing everything he can to take some ground off Perkett and to get the toe on the back straight. Minute and three quarters remaining now, qualifying 12. This sets up the grid for our final race of the day this afternoon. How's this shot? Exit turn two and through that sweeping right-hander at three. They're all chasing a 50.84 achieved by Thomas Randall. On his own, up the back straight is Todd Hazelwood at the moment. Everybody else is following another. But the cool drive entries at turn six, he's on his own. We're keeping an eye on Percat and Mostert. Now, Will Brown's gone quicker in sector one than any other. 17.4 in that first intermediate. And that takes him into the braking area at the hairpin turn four. 24 cars on the racetrack, coming up now to one minute. They've also gone in and out of a little bit of cloud cover. Right at the moment, it's a southeasterly. So it's gone back to the way in which it was in that previous qualifying session. It was Brown, now it's Kostecki again. There's a number of 50.6 at the top of the tree. Kostecki, Brown, now LeBrock, great job. Cam Hill jumps into the party here as well. Randall's still in fourth. 
Kostecki, Brown, LeBrock, Randall, Hill. Slade jumps up, Feeney jumps up. His teammate goes with him into sixth. <laughs> They've all got a toe. This is now Cam Waters up 11 positions with a 50.65. So 50.62 for Kostecki, 50.64 for Brown, 50.65 for Waters, 50.67 for LeBrock. And Cam is chasing Will up into the hairpin, so he's in behind a shell car once again. Now, he's gone quicker in Sector 1, though, as a result of that. But is he going to have a repeat occurrence of what happened at Turn 6? Here he is, tucked under the back of the Shell V-Power racing car. He'll get a benefit in a straight line, but what can he do with it at the other end of the straight here? He's going to have to shadow him. Does he have to pass another car again in Quali? Yep. And he does, and, and he makes contact. So contact for the second time in a row in successive qualifying sessions. Kostecki looks like he may have stitched another pole. He's done a 50.6. Waters, though, from the previous lap. Still in third spot, and we've got Winterbottom down here off the road between one and two. Wow, what a crazy back end of the session. As soon as I saw the onboard that we took there of Cam heading up to turn four, I realised how close he was, and then we found the shot up the back straight. And the problem there is you get the incredible benefit in a straight line, but you know that it's going to be a problem in the braking area. I mean, you can't, you've effectively got to make a pass to finish your lap. So it's almost history repeats. Uh, let's take a bit there and it, it run into both the shell cars at the final corner, effectively. However, the up side of the story for Cam Waters, he's on the second row of the grid. Yeah. He's in third position and he's gone quicker in sectors one and two than any other. So here's the toe, getting the benefit, but now what do you do with it? It compels you to pass. So he bombs down the inside, locks briefly, side to side contact, and got out the other side. He probably got away with it a bit. 15-8 plays 15-6 in the last sector. So Cam did a 15-8, Will Brown did a 15-6, so there would have been a little bit of time. You can't make contact without losing some. Oh, let's all take a breath. Brody Kostecki has the pole by one one hundredth of a second <laughs> over his teammate. Well done again, Coca-Cola by Erebus. Cam Waters in third, got away with it. LeBrock, another fine performance from Slade. And he's being engineered by Blake Smith this weekend. And then we've got Feeney, Cam Hill again. Thomas Randall survived in eighth position by doing that time early. And then Van Gisbergen and Winterbottom, our top ten. And we saw Frosty off the road down there on the inside of turn two. Just outside the top ten, Mostert, then Payne forward. Perkat, Heimgarten, and Golding, Di Pasquale, Reynolds, Courtney, and Macaulay Jones, position number 20, followed by Pye, Hazelwood, Fraser, Davison, who we just saw, unfortunately, in the wars there at turn six, and Jack Smith. Armour all pole position, though, goes to Brody Kostecki. It's starting to get some familiarity about this story. So, he came to the race weekend with two, then it became three a little earlier, and it's just become four. Uh, he's well in the zone. Beautiful job. And, boy, he's scampering away with these by margins that you, you dare not challenge. 0 0.0183 gas to get that one in the bag. That's a fine drive. His fifth Armour All career pole. Brody Kostecki, back-to-back poles this morning, mate. Nice comeback from yesterday's disappointing race result. You and your teammate having a nice little battle at the moment. Yeah, actually, I have to give a bit of credit to him. I actually uh, sat there in the truck this morning and listened to Odell with him and I I asked for a bit of his potion. So, um, no, it's just a great bounce back from yesterday. And, you know, the boys had a fair bit of work yesterday after, you know, both uh, steering arms at the back of the car was a bit damaged. So, uh, yeah, it's great to repay them back with, uh, you know, a double pole. And I think Will's right up there as well. So, awesome day so far. Any changes to the car between sessions or it was just a matter of deal with the conditions that we had out there? Yeah, just deal with the conditions that were out there. I think the um, category that was on before us, you know, our tyres don't really gel too well with them. So it was just more about, you know, trying to maximise the track evolving and and uh, just tried to do, you, you know, some clean laps. And, you know, luckily that last one I got set up behind um, Will there pretty well. So, yeah, we both sort of got double toe there. We saw in Perth that Will went to school on what you did overnight and improved on the Sunday. Did you go to school on what Will did yesterday in qualifying, come back this morning with a bit of what he did? I did, Garth. I went to school last night, did a bit of research and come back today. What did you learn? Um, I'll keep that between Will and I. Well done, mate. Now, looking forward to the race. You didn't really get a clean run at yesterday's race. Will obviously had a great result. Uh, you look at what he did. Do you think well, you've got what you need car speed-wise? Yeah, I think, you know, Will was pretty strong yesterday and was able to manage the pace quite well. So, yeah, I think our race cars would be quite well. I was pretty confident in practice. So, 